All right, folks, I'm back. So this week I'm going to go over the last three churches and then this, we're gonna start discussing chapter four of the book of Revelation. So anyway, before I begin, dear Father, Father, I just thank you for letting me bring forth your word. I just ask that you just give me your wisdom, Father. I just ask that you just let this message uh, Reach somebody's heart, Father. Just open people's hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. So I forgot my tablet. I'm using the pastor's Bible here. So beginning in chapter 3, verse 1, this is what it says. To the angel of the church of Sardis, right? He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this. I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. So how many churches in the United States and even around the world are like this? They claim they're alive, but they're, they're really dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which are about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of God. Um, apparently here he's deeds would be like their good works now good works don't save you they only are an outward sign that you are saved so what God is saying here is their good works just just didn't measure up to God's standards Okay, so verse three. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. So here God is encouraging these people to not only wake up, but to repent. Because if they don't wake up, then he says he's going to come like a thief. And they won't know what hour he's coming. And I don't know what he will do at that point. The Bible doesn't say. Probably take their candle away from them. Remember, the Lord can open, he can close, he can close, he can open. So maybe that's what he's talking about here. Verse 4, but you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their gar soiled their garments. And they walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So some of the people in Sardis obviously were doing what God wanted them to do, but most of them, it sounds like, weren't doing anything at all or nothing that was pleasing in the eyes of God. So God is telling these people to repent. And if they don't, he's going to come like a thief. He who overcomes will be clothed in, a, in white garments and I will erase his name. I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So. White is, um, is a color of purity. And we know that when, when Jesus returns, his heavenly army, and uh, including us, are all gonna return with him, and we're all gonna be clothed in white garments. So it says here too, that those who overcome, he won't erase from the book of life. So again, he's talking about perseverance. You know, the Christian life is a life of perseverance. All right, let's go on. Verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, 
He was holy, he was true, he was the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and he, and he who shuts and no one opens, says this. So God has the ability to open and shut and shut and open and no one can reverse that. I know your deeds. Before, behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. So what was this open door? Well, it was probably a door to evangelize. Because you have little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. So even though these people had little power, they kept the words, Lord, and they were persevering. So God opened a door for them to apparently go out and evangelize. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Now, I'm not really sure what, what that means. Now, there might have been a synagogue in the city of Philadelphia that was comprised of Jews that worship Satan. That's probably what it means here. And what Jesus is saying here in effect is because you have persevered, because you have overcome, you have kept my word, I'm going to make these people come down and bow before you. That's probably what it means. Because you have kept my word, uh, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, here we go with that word again, perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So what is God talking about here? What's this hour of testing? Well, I believe it's the tribulation. Because it's going to test those who dwell on the earth. So who who is it that's going to be dwelling on the earth when this hour of testing comes? Non-believers. Non They're the ones that are going to be dwelling on the earth. See, all true believers are going to be taken out, I believe, in the rapture just before the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation period begins. Also, John uses the word here um, he uses the word ek okay, the word keep is the, is the Greek word ek and what it means is to be taken out of a situation to be physically taken out of a situation. Now he could have used another word, dia, which means to go through, physically go through, but he didn't use that, that word here. He used the word ek, which means to be physically removed from the situation. So this is why many people believe that the church will not go through the tribulation because of the fact that John uses the word et and not dia. Plus also, beginning in chapter 4 of the book of Revelation, the church is not mentioned again until chapter 22. The end of the book. That's 18 chapters. <clears throat> so where is the church 
during this seven year period of time? Well, I think it's been removed. Just like John is saying here, it has been physically removed because the tribulation is not for believers. The tribulation is for unbelievers. Now there are some Christians, because I've talked to them, who say, oh Dave, the church needs to go through the tribulation because we, we need to have our sins atoned for. Really? Well, I thought Jesus' death on the cross took care of that. You see, what does Ephesians 2.8 say? It is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. So if we all went through the tribulation, we could all boast how we made it through on our own merits and our own skill and all this. See, it's not about that, folks. Our, our salvation is in Jesus Christ, not going through halfway through or all the way through the tribulation period. Nope. The church will not be here. All right. Let's go on. Oh, no, 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 I'm not done yet. I am coming quickly. Hold fast to that you have so that no one will take your crown. So, in other words, the rewards we have already accumulated. Now, no one, no one knows how many rewards we're going to get, how many crowns we're going to get. But what, what Christ is saying here is, don't lose hold of what you've already won. Don't let the enemy overcome you and take from you what you're going to eventually get. He, see, he who overcomes, again, it's about perseverance. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he will not go out from it anymore and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and, and, my, new, and my new name. So, now, I'm not sure what he means by a pillar here. The notes don't say anything. Perhaps what he's talking about here, it's not a, it's not a physical pillar, obviously. But perhaps what he's saying here is that these people that overcome will be continual servants in the temple in the new Jerusalem, which would be like a pillar. You're upholding the institution through your service. Okay, and then God is going to write, um, and then God is also going to write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem. So somewhere, somewhere, these individuals that are going to serve in the temple in the new Jerusalem are going to have God's name and the city, the new city of Jerusalem written somewhere on their, on their being, on their, um, uh, resurrected bodies. It doesn't say where, but that's what it's telling me. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So again, you know, it's all about perseverance, folks. Perseverance. That's what, that's what Christ is calling us to a life of, a life of 
perseverance. All right, let's go on. Verse 14, the last church. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, <coughs> the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds. Oh, by the way, the church of Philadelphia was the second church that did not receive a rebuke from the Lord. Two churches received no rebuke and five churches received a rebuke. So we're at the last church here. Let me start again. This is the message to Laodicea. To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. So what God is saying, you know, lukewarm water doesn't, doesn't, doesn't taste very good. And so God is saying because you taste nasty in my mouth because you're lukewarm, I'm just going to spit you out. I would rather have you either be cold or hot, but I don't want you lukewarm because you taste nasty in my mouth. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You know, that's the problem with the church today, folks. They have this Laodicea mentality. Oh, we're rich. We have everything we need. Eh. Why do we need to evangelize? Why do we need to go out and and and, and fulfill the Great Commission? Ah, we're just called to live a comfortable life, a name it and grant, a name it and claim it, nab it and grab it type of lifestyle. And God never says that anywhere. As a matter of fact, he says to those people that believe that. You are lukewarm. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. We are not called to a comfortable lifestyle. We are being called to a life of perseverance and fulfilling the Great Commission, not accumulating worldly wealth. I'm sorry to say, but that's the way it is. I mean, if if we were supposed to acquire worldly wealth, like a lot of these phony baloney um, 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 preachers that, you know, that preach this phony baloney message of, you know, um, oh, you can become rich, you can have this, you can have that then how come Jesus wasn't rich? Jesus didn't have any houses. He didn't have any worldly wealth. How come Jesus never said, well, just name it and claim it, nab it and grab it. How come he didn't preach that? How come none of the 12 apostles, they, they weren't rich? Sure, some of them had houses. Some of them um, even worked. I would say probably all of them worked, but they also gave their lives, except for John, who's the only one that died um, a natural death. All the rest of them died as martyrs. Preaching the word of God. And guess what? We're supposed to be the same way. Okay? These prosperity preachers have come in and caused a lot of harm in the church. They, they take scripture, they twist it around and make it say what it doesn't mean, completely ignoring the fact that 
Jesus and his disciples didn't live that way. Okay, and they just make up this, this entire phony baloney, name it and claim it, nab it and grab it um, doctrine. And there's no truth to it. Okay, absolutely none. So what are we supposed to do? Jesus says, what, what are these people supposed to do? He says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. See, we're supposed to accumulate godly riches, not worldly riches, because worldly riches, you know, in the end, when we kick the can, when we slip out of the banana peel, you know, all our worldly riches are not going with us. They're not going to be buried with us like the pharaohs of old who buried everything, okay, had everything buried with them and thinking that, oh, man, I'm going to use all this stuff in the afterlife. Well, guess what? The only ones that gained anything from all those riches that were buried with many of these pharaohs were the tomb raiders. You know, the, the pharaohs that were buried with all their stuff, their bodies remained where they were. They didn't, they didn't go anywhere. Now their spirit went someplace, and unfortunately, it, it didn't go where they thought it was going to go. You know, those pharaohs, they all went to hell because they didn't, they didn't trust in God. They trusted in their own gods. You know, and all that wealth that was buried with them, didn't amount to one iota, man. Didn't help them at all. But like I said, hey, those Tomb Raiders got rich, right? And there's still Tomb Raiders today. So the only ones that are getting rich when they find those, um, those burying places where the pharaohs are, are the Tomb Raiders. And believe me, they've walked away with what today would probably amount to millions and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of gold and jewels and, and so many other things, right? But when they died, what did it, what did it, um, what did it get them? It, it didn't get them anything, all right? So your worldly wealth isn't going to amount to anything because one day everything is just going to burn up anyway. Uh, so it goes on here and says, uh, we're to buy white garments so that, that you may clothe yourself and that your shame and your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. So again, here's these white garments. And God is saying, hey, Purchase my gold. Purchase these white garments. How do we purchase all this? Not with worldly money, but by serving him. By doing good works for him. Showing people that, hey, you know, I'm doing these good works because I, I believe in Christ. And now I'm not doing them to get saved. I'm doing them because I am saved. Okay, and then this ISAB. Laodicea was a world famous spot because they had this ISAB that supposedly cured many eye diseases and things like that. Now, I'm not sure if that's true. I mean, history says they were well known for this ISAB. Whether it really worked or not is what I mean is I don't know, because I wasn't there. But that's what they were known for, this world-famous ISAB. <sighs> Mike, I'm in the middle of a Bible study. I'll call you back. Okay. Okay, so let's go on. So it says here, verse 20. 
Oh no. 19. Those whom I love, I, repre I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. So he's telling them to repent. You know, he said that a few times here in the first, in the, in the next, you know, in, the, in, these, in these two chapters covering these seven churches. Verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. So here Jesus is giving the invitation for us to open the door to let us to let him come in. Now, I'm sure we've all seen this picture where Jesus is standing in front of the door, <clears throat> but there's no doorknob on the door. That's because the doorknob is inside the door and we're the only ones that can open it. Now some people use this verse uh, to say, well, Jesus is knocking at our hearts to come in to, to, to save us. Well, I think it also means that Jesus is standing at the door, door waiting for us to open it so he can come in and have fellowship with us who are already saved. Okay. See, when, when we become Christians, see, God wants access to, 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 to what every room in your, in your heart. He, he doesn't want closed doors. It's only us who can open those closed doors in our heart and let him have access to those places. And yes, he is standing at the heart of many unbelievers. He's, he's standing at the heart of many unbelievers and waiting for them to open the door to him. So we can apply to both. He who overcomes again, uh, another word for persevering, I will grant him to sit down on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. So in other words, <clears throat> we're going to be helping Christ rule and reign in the millennial kingdom. Now does that mean we're going to take over and do things on our own? No. Christ is going to be the head. We're going to just be helping him. God has given man thousands of years to get his act together. Okay, ever since the time of the flood, when God institutionalized um government okay we've had since the end of the flood to get our act together and we have not as a matter of fact instead of getting our act together we're becoming more and more like it was in the days of Noah the earth is filled with corruption and violence and it just keeps getting worse every day and why is that because man is a sinner and man does not want to follow what the Bible says he doesn't want to do what God says he just wants to do his own thing and this is why the world is in such a big mess okay so God has given us thousands of years to get our act together and we have not done it so this is one reason Christ has to come back and establish his kingdom here on earth to fix the mess that we've made. All right, and he's the only one that's going to be able to do that. You know, man through his social programs is not going to accomplish All right, folks, I'm back. 
So this week I'm going to go over the last three churches and then we're going to start discussing chapter 4 of the book of Revelation. So anyway, before I begin, dear Father, Father, I just thank you for letting me bring forth your word. I just ask that you just give me your wisdom, Father. I just ask that you just let this message uh, reach somebody's heart, Father. Just open people's hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. So I forgot my tablet. I'm using the pastor's Bible here. So beginning in chapter 3, verse 1, this is what it says. To the angel of the church of Sardis, right? He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this. I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. So how many churches in the United States and even around the world are like this? They claim they're alive, but they're, they're really dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which are about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of God. Um, apparently here his deeds would be like their good works. Now, good works don't save you. They only are an outward sign that you are saved. So what God is saying here is their good works just just didn't measure up to God's standards. Okay, so verse 3. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. So here God is encouraging these people to not only wake up, but to repent. Because if they don't wake up, then he says he's going to come like a thief. And they won't know what hour he's coming. And I don't know what he will do at that point. The Bible doesn't say. Probably take their candle away from them. Remember, the Lord can open, he can close, he can close, he can open. <coughs> so maybe that's what he's talking about here. Verse 4, but you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their gar soiled their garments. And they walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So... Some of the people in Sardis obviously were doing what God wanted them to do, but most of them, it sounds like, weren't doing anything at all or nothing that was pleasing in the eyes of God. So God is telling these people to repent. And if they don't, he's going to come like a thief. He who overcomes will be clothed in, a, in white garments, and I will erase his name I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, white is, um, is a color of purity. And we know that when, when Jesus returns, his heavenly army and uh, including us are all going to return with them and we're all going to be clothed in white garments so it says here too that those who overcome he won't erase from the book of life so again he's talking about perseverance you know the Christian life is a life of Perseverance. All right, let's go on. Verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, 
He was holy, he was true, he was the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and he, and he who shuts and no one opens says this. So God has the ability to open and shut and shut and open and no one can reverse that. I know your deeds. Before, behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. So what was this open door? Well, it was probably a door to evangelize. Because you have little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. So even though these people had little power, they kept the words, Lord, and they were persevering. So God opened a door for them to apparently go out and evangelize. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Now I'm not really sure what what that means. Now there might have been a synagogue in the city of Philadelphia that was comprised of Jews that worship Satan. That's probably what it means here. And what Jesus is saying here in effect is because you have persevered, because you have overcome, you have kept my word, I'm going to make these people come down and bow before you. That's probably what it means. Because you have kept my word, uh, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, here we go with that word again, perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So what is God talking about here? What's this hour of testing? Well, I believe it's the tribulation. Because it's going to test those who dwell on the earth. So who, who is it that's going to be dwelling on the earth when this hour of testing comes? Non-believers. Non they're the ones that are going to be dwelling on the earth. See, all true believers are going to be taken out, I believe, in the rapture just before the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation period begins. Also, John uses the word here, um, He uses the word ek. Okay, the word keep. Is the, is the Greek word ek. And what it means is to be taken out of a situation. To be physically taken out of a situation. Now he could have used another word dia which means to go through, physically go through, but he didn't use that, that word here. He used the word ek, which means to be physically removed from the situation. So this is why many people believe that the church will not go through the tribulation because of the fact that John uses the word ek and not dia. Plus also, beginning in chapter 4 of the book of Revelation, the church is not mentioned again until chapter 22. The end of the book, that's 18 chapters. <clears throat> so where is the church 
during this seven year period of time? Well, I think it's been removed. Just like John is saying here, it has been physically removed because the tribulation is not for believers. The tribulation is for unbelievers. Now there are some Christians, because I've talked to them, who say, oh Dave, the church needs to go through the tribulation because we, we need to have our sins atoned for. Really? Well, I thought Jesus' death on the cross took care of that. You see, what does Ephesians 2.8 say? It is not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. So if we all went through the tribulation, we could all boast how we made it through on our own merits and our own skill and all this. See, it's not about that, folks. Our, our salvation is in Jesus Christ, not going through halfway through or all the way through the tribulation period. Nope. The church will not be here. All right. Let's go on. Oh, no, 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 I'm not done yet. I am coming quickly. Hold fast to that you have so that no one will take your crown. So, in other words, the rewards we have already accumulated. Now, no one, no one knows how many rewards we're gonna get, how many crowns we're gonna get. But what, what Christ is saying here is, don't lose hold of what you've already won. Don't let the enemy overcome you and take from you what you're going to eventually get. He, see, he who overcomes, again, it's about perseverance. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and and my new and my new name. So I'm not sure what he means by a pillar here. The notes don't say anything. Perhaps what he's talking about here. It's not a it's not a physical pillar, obviously. But perhaps what he's saying here is that. These people that overcome will be continual servants in the temple in the new Jerusalem, which would be like a pillar. You're upholding the institution through your service. Okay, and then God is going to write... Um, that God is also going to write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem. So somewhere, somewhere, these individuals that are going to serve in the temple in the new Jerusalem are going to have God's name and the city, the new city of Jerusalem written somewhere on their, on their being, on their um, uh, resurrected bodies. It doesn't say where, but that's what it's telling me. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So again, you know, it's all about perseverance, folks. Perseverance. That's what, that's what Christ is calling us to a life of. A life of 
perseverance. All right, let's go on. Verse 14, the last church. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, <coughs> the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds. Oh, by the way, the church of Philadelphia was the second church that did not receive a rebuke from the Lord. Two churches received no rebuke and five churches received a rebuke. So we're at the last church here. Let me start again. This is the message to Laodicea. To the angel of the church of Laodicea write the amen, the faithful, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. So what God is saying, you know, lukewarm water doesn't, doesn't, doesn't taste very good. And so God is saying because you taste nasty in my mouth because you're lukewarm, I'm just gonna spit you out. I would rather have you either be cold or hot, but I don't want you lukewarm because you taste nasty in my mouth. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You know, that's the problem with the church today, folks. They have this Laodicea mentality. Oh, we're rich. We have everything we need. Eh, why do we need to evangelize? Why do we need to go out and, 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 Fulfill the Great Commission. Ah, we're just called to live a comfortable life, a name it and claim it, name it and claim it, nab it and grab it type of lifestyle. And God never says that anywhere. As a matter of fact, he says to those people that believe that, you are lukewarm. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. We are not called to a comfortable lifestyle. We are being called to a life of perseverance and fulfilling the Great Commission, not accumulating worldly wealth. I'm sorry to say, but that's the way it is. I mean, if, if we were supposed to acquire worldly wealth, like a lot of these phony baloney, um, uh, um, uh, 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 preachers that you know that preach this phony baloney message of you know uh, oh you can be comfort you can have this you can have that then how come Jesus wasn't rich Jesus didn't have any houses. He didn't have any worldly wealth. How come Jesus never said, well, just name it and claim it, nab it and grab it. How come he didn't preach that? How come none of the 12 apostles, they, they weren't rich? Sure, some of them had houses. Some of them um, even worked. I would say probably all of them worked, but they also gave their lives, except for John, who's the only one that died um, a natural death. All the rest of them died as martyrs. Preaching the word of God. And guess what? We're supposed to be the same way. Okay? These prosperity preachers have come in and caused a lot of harm in the church. They, they take scripture, they twist it around and make it say what it doesn't mean, completely ignoring the fact that 
Jesus and his disciples didn't live that way. Okay, and they just make up this, this entire phony baloney, name it and claim it, nab it and grab it um, doctrine. And there's no truth to it. Okay, absolutely none. So what are we supposed to do? Jesus says, what, what are these people supposed to do? He says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. See, we're supposed to accumulate godly riches, not worldly riches, because worldly riches, you know, in the end, when we kick the can, when we slip out of the banana peel, you know, all our worldly riches are not going with us. They're not going to be buried with us like the pharaohs of old who buried everything, okay, had everything buried with them and thinking that, oh, man, I'm going to use all this stuff in the afterlife. Well, guess what? The only ones that gained anything from all those riches that were buried with many of these pharaohs were the tomb raiders. You know, the, the pharaohs that were buried with all their stuff, their bodies remained where they were. They didn't, they didn't go anywhere. Now their spirit went someplace and unfortunately, it, it didn't go where they thought it was gonna go. You know, those pharaohs, they all went to hell because they didn't, they didn't trust in God. They trusted in their own gods. You know, and all that wealth that was buried with them didn't amount to one iota, man. Didn't help them at all. But like I said, hey, those Tomb Raiders got rich, right? And they're still Tomb Raiders today. So the only ones that are getting rich when they find those, um, those burying places where the pharaohs are, are the tomb raiders. And believe me, they've walked away with what today would probably amount to millions and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of gold and jewels and, and so many other things, right? But when they died, what did it, what did it, um, what did it get them? It, it didn't get them anything, all right? So your worldly wealth isn't going to amount to anything because one day everything is just going to burn up anyway. Uh, so it goes on here and says, uh, we're to buy white garments so that, that you may clothe yourself and that your shame and your nakedness will not be revealed. And I said to anoint your eyes so that you may see. So again, here's these white garments. And God is saying, hey, purchase my gold. Purchase these white garments. How do we purchase all this? Not with worldly money, but by serving him. By doing good works for him. Showing people that, hey, you know, I'm doing these good works because I... I believe in Christ. I now I'm not doing them to get saved. I'm doing them because I am saved. Okay, and then this ISAB. Laodicea was a world famous spot because they had this ISAB that supposedly cured many eye diseases and things like that. Now, I'm not sure if that's true. I mean, history says they were well known for this ISAP. Whether it really worked or not is what I mean is, I don't know, because I wasn't there. But that's what they were known for, this world famous ISAP. <sighs> Mike, I'm in the middle of a Bible study. I'll call you back. Okay. Okay, so let's go on. So it says here, verse 20, 
Oh no. 19. Those whom I love, I, repre I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. So he's telling them to repent. You know, he said that a few times here in the first, in the, in the next, you know, in, the, in, these, in these two chapters covering these seven churches. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. So here Jesus is giving the invitation for us to open the door to let us to let him come in. Now, I'm sure we've all seen this picture where Jesus is standing in front of the door, <clears throat> but there's no doorknob on the door. That's because the doorknob is inside the door and we're the only ones that can open it. Now some people use this verse uh, to say, well, Jesus is knocking at our hearts to come in to, to, to save us. Well, I think it also means that Jesus is standing at the door, door waiting for us to open it so he can come in and have fellowship with us who are already saved. Okay. See, when, when we become Christians, see, God wants access to, 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 to what every room in your, in your heart. He doesn't want closed doors. It's only us who can open those closed doors in our heart and let him have access to those places. And yes, he is standing at the heart of many unbelievers. He's, he's standing at the heart of many unbelievers and waiting for them to open the door to him. So we can apply to both. He who overcomes again, uh, another word for persevering, I will grant him to sit down on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. So in other words, <clears throat> we're going to be helping Christ rule and reign in the millennial kingdom. Now does that mean we're going to take over and do things on our own? No. Christ is going to be the head. We're going to just be helping him. God has given man thousands of years to get his act together. Okay, ever since the time of the flood, when God institutionalized um, government, okay, we've had since the end of the flood to get our act together. And we have not. As a matter of fact, instead of getting our act together, we're becoming more and more like it was in the days of Noah. The earth is filled with corruption and violence. And it just keeps getting worse every day. And why is that? Because man is a sinner. And man does not want to follow what the Bible says. He doesn't want to do what God says. He just wants to do his own thing. And this is why the world is in such a big mess. Okay, so God has given us thousands of years to get our act together. And we have not done it. So this is one reason Christ has to come back and establish his kingdom here on earth to fix the mess that we've made. All right, and he's the only one that's going to be able to do that. You know, man through his social programs is not going to accomplish anything. You can give a person a place to live, clothing, food, money, but if there's not an inward change, 
from, from, if there's not a change from within, all these social programs mean nothing. You know, you can give a person all those things that I just said, and he can, he'll still be a drug addict. He'll still be a drunk. You know, he'll still live a promiscuous lifestyle. Unless there's a change from within, all these social programs don't mean anything. Okay, because man is not going to institutionalize the change that all of us need from within, and he certainly is not going to usher in the kingdom of God like some of these phony baloney cults teach. Okay, man will have nothing, 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 absolutely nothing to do with that. Okay, nowhere in the Bible does it say that man is going to solely rule over this kingdom that that Christ is going to set up when he comes back. Put that thought out of your head, folks, because it's not going to happen. 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So again, we're supposed to pay attention to what the Spirit is saying. It says that seven times in the book of Revelation in chapters 2 through 3. It says it once for each church. So God is trying to get our attention. We are to pay attention to what the Spirit says and we are to overcome. Persevere and listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. It couldn't be more clear than that. Chapter 4, verse 1. After these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I heard like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me said come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. So right here at the beginning of chapter 4 at the beginning of chapter 4 verse 1 the church is not mentioned again until the end of the book of Revelation in chapter 22 18 chapters into the book okay so this begins the third part of the book of Revelation and what I mean by the third part is is the book is broken down into three parts chapter one is the past because the events that took place on the island of Patmos and John who wrote all the events down have long since happened so chapter one is past chapter two and three that's the present, that's the church age. So each of the seven churches we read about, okay, every church today in the world uh, takes on one or more of those attributes of those seven churches. So that's why it's called the church age, which is what we're still in right now and we're waiting for what's going to take place here in chapter 4, verse 1, when we are called up into heaven, not to come back until after the seventh year tribulation when we'll come back with Christ to rule and reign. So this is where we're at right now, starting in chapter 4, going all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, which is 18 chapters more, is all future. Okay? It's not something that's already happened. Not like these preterists preach. That Jesus came in 70 AD 
when the Romans invaded Israel and destroyed everything. Well, that's strange. If Jesus came back in 70 AD, according to them, and set up their and set up his kingdom, uh, where is it? Why is the world in such a mess? Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you what preterism is. Preterism is a form of anti-Semitism. It's just an anti-Semitic doctrine to push the Jews out of their uh, assigned spot. Remember, God has a place. God has a plan and a purpose for the nation of Israel and the Jewish people and preterism negates all that. It says, nah, these people, Israel, they don't have any plan or purpose. Um, preterism says that the Jewish people and the nation of Israel no longer have a have a have a place or a purpose in God's plan, which is a big lie, because they do. So they they cancel out preterism cancels out everything that the Bible talks about when it comes to uh, the Jewish people and the nation of Israel having a place in God's prophetic program, it cancels all that out. It says Christ has already come. Which, I, which again, I'd like to ask you, well, where did he come to, folks? The Middle East is in a big mess, along with the rest of the world. There is no peace. Okay, all the wrongs in this world have not been righted. No, ju there's no justice in this world. So, where where did Christ come to? He came no place. Preterism is just a fallacy. Okay, it's just some occultic dream that somebody came up with to replace. Uh, to have the church replace Israel. Okay, it's just, not only is it a subtle form of anti-Semitism, but it's also a form of replacement theology, which says the church has kicked Israel aside and replaced her, and now they no longer have a place in God's prophetic program, which again is a big lie. So, oh, MR. So, this is where we're at. So, verse 2 Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. Who, so, who is this one sitting on the throne? Well, it's, it's Jesus. And he was sitting, and he was sitting, was like, a jasper stone and a sardis in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. So this throne is, is glorious, folks. Around the throne were 24 other thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. So here we have these elders sitting around this throne, this beautiful throne, and apparently these elders, their main purpose, duty, I believe, is, is to worship God. They're not there, it seems like, for anything else. They're not there to give God advice. Uh, they're not there to counsel Him. They're there to simply give Him 
praise. I mean, when we get further along, you'll see what I mean. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, folks, you notice I don't have any notes in front of me, but if you go to Isaiah chapter 11, it lists the seven spirits of God and it all relates to Jesus. Okay, that's the one who's sitting on the throne is Jesus. And before the throne was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion and the second creature was like a calf and the third creature was like, I mean, had the face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. Again, where are these references? Well, if you go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter, chapter 1 or chapter 2, it talks about these same angelic beings. Okay, I think they're seraphim. They talk about, it describes them exactly the same way they're being described here. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes uh, <coughs> around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So again, where is this reference? This has happened before. Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah was in the temple, he had a vision of God. And these angels des described exactly like they are here. Saying what? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So... You can find these creatures in the book of Ezekiel and Isaiah. Nine. And when the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne to him who lives forever and ever, of course, that's Jesus Christ. The 24 elders fell down before him who <coughs> sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O I'm sorry, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of you, uh, and because of your will, they exist and were created. So that's the whole duty of these 24 elders, is to praise God 24-7 and cast down their thrones, because like it says, He is worthy and that's all these elders do okay they don't do anything else like i said they're not there to advise they're not there to counsel they are there to praise the lord jesus christ okay the book of uh, chapter five so I saw the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a book written, and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. So now we're getting into 
what I consider the most important part, the most interesting part of the book of Revelation, which is the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls, which, um, which will be opened, blown, and poured out over a seven year period. Verse two, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? Now, we don't know who this strong angel is. The Bible doesn't say. So there's no, no need, no reason to speculate. Just leave it as it is. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or look, at, or look into it. So this strong angel is giving this proclamation, hey, who's worthy to open this book? Well, so far, no one, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth is, has been found worthy to open this book and to break the seals. First four. Then I began to weep. Now this is John speaking. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, now this is one of the 24 elders. By the way, these 24 elders are not JWs. They are not, they are not associated with any cult here on earth. Okay, I don't know who these 24 elders are, but like I said, their whole duty is to praise God and throw their crowns down at his feet 24-7. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. So who is this lamb that this, or this lion, I'm sorry, who is this lion that this, one of these elders is talking about? It's Jesus. Jesus is the lion. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders, a lamb, another reference to Jesus, standing as if slain, talking about his crucifixion, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So here comes Jesus, the lion and the lamb of Judah, He's the only one that's worthy to open this sealed document. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sits on the throne. Okay, so the one sitting on the throne is God and Jesus comes and takes this sealed document out of the hand of God. Now, now we're getting into the Trinity here, folks. I have no idea how Jesus could take the sealed document out of the hand of God since he is God. Now, one, one explanation is, is when Jesus ascended into heaven, he ascended in a, a human body. Okay. He ascended in a human body of flesh and bone, but no blood. So perhaps he's still in his human form here. Okay. And uh, 
and God is still in his spiritual form. Oh, it's, it's hard to explain. So you know what, I'm not even going to try. But at any rate, we have the Father and the Son here interacting with each other. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Now, not God this time, but before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So now these elders are worshiping the Lamb, who, by the way, is God, but God manifested in human form. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals. Talking about Jesus. For you were slain. That's Jesus again, because he was slain. Where? On Calvary's cross. And you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation. So what they're saying here is when Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, he shed it for all of humanity. In effect, purchasing man's salvation by the shedding of his blood. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign upon the earth. Talking about us, okay, the, the saints that are saved, we're the ones that are going to help Christ rule and reign upon the earth when he comes back at the end of the seven year tribulation. Verse 11, then I looked and I heard a voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands and thousands. In other words, incalculable. Nobody knows, I mean, millions and billions. Let's just put it that way. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is a lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. 13, and every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever in the book of Philippians it says that everything in heaven on the earth under the earth and in the ocean is going to one day give God honor, praise, and glory. So here we have the beginning of that. And the four creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. So these four creatures and the elders, all they do is worship God 24-7. Well, folks, that's it. I'm going to. Um, I'm going to. Okay. I'm going to call it quick for today because this is not my Bible. This is my pastor's Bible. And I need to give it back to him because I forgot my tablet. So we'll pick it up next week uh, uh, on chapter 6 the breaking of the seven seals. Now we're getting into the more interesting parts of the book of Revelation. Um, and from here on in, things are just going to move. I mean, it's just going to be one thing after another. It's going to be um, like, an, like an action movie, but <laughs> that's not the point. The point is, is... God is getting ready, Jesus is getting ready to begin the tribulation period, a time of great agony that's going to eventually come upon this earth 
not for believers, but for unbelievers. So until next week, God bless you. My name is Dave Martin. Shalom. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, dear Father, Father, just thank you for this time of fellowship. I just, just ask that you just uh, give us all traveling mercies as we make our way back to where we live. I just ask that you just bring us all safely here on Sunday and next week. In Jesus' name.